Is there a retirement option that does not appear on your pension election form? Insurance agents say that there is, and they call this hidden option a pension max. So in this video, I want to continue the series that I've been doing on employer pensions by discussing so-called pension maximization strategies. And this video is going to be somewhat involved because my aim here is to present both sides, both the pro and the con sides in a thorough and forceful manner. Now, in a moment, I'll get into the question of why it has the name Pension Max, but let's begin with, I think, more important issue. What is it? So simply stated, a Pension Max involves the use of a life insurance policy and an annuity as an alternative to or as a replacement for the standard survivorship options that you will be presented with on a pension election form. In a nutshell, the Pension Max strategy tells you to select the largest payout available. This will require that you give up a survivor benefit for your spouse, but that's okay because the insurance agent will make up the difference with a life insurance policy and an annuity. Now, in order to understand the Pension Max, you really have to have a solid foundational understanding of what the normal pension election options are. Now, I am gonna do a brief review of these here, but because I'm gonna move so quickly through them, if you don't have a grasp on what they are, I do invite you to stop the video and go back to an earlier video that I did on pension election options to make sure that you have a firm understanding. And of course, by standard option, I mean the options that are actually going to appear on the pension election form. Honestly, the foundational concepts are vital, not only for understanding the pension max, but also for making the choice that you're going to have to make when it comes time to elect a certain option for your pension. But if you do have a handle on that, then it may be helpful to take those questions and visualize them as a flow chart. There are three waves of questions. The first one is, do you want to take a lump sum or installment payments? Some of these answers are going to terminate the flow chart. If you take a lump sum, then you stop the questions right here. Now, this is not the place to get into that particular particular choice. I have a dedicated video on the question of taking the lump sum or not, and I invite you to see that for details. But if you select installment payments as an option, then you're going to proceed to the next question. And that question is, do you want to have survivorship or no survivorship? Roughly, you can think of a survivor as the pensions beneficiary. If you select no survivorship, this stops the flowchart. And if you select survivorship, then the next question is, how much survivorship do you want? Now, this is expressed as a percentage of the pensioner's payment. Some common choices include 25 percent, 50 percent, 66 and two thirds, 75 or 100 percent. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use 50 percent and 100 percent. Let me summarize what we've seen so far. If you take the lump sum, you're basically saying that you want to depend on your investment portfolio. On the other hand, if you select installments and survivorship, you're basically saying you want to depend on your employer, not just for your income, but for your beneficiary after you pass. So where does the pension max idea fit in? The pension max is going to fit in if you select installment payments for yourself and no survivorship. That is, survivorship is going to depend on insurance. Why would a person choose this option? Number one, a person might choose it if they think it promises to give them more retirement income. That is, that it would increase their installment amount. Number two, they might choose it just because it gives them more flexibility. That is, it increases their survivorship possibilities, their beneficiary options, and they might do this even if it does not increase their income. And in a few cases, they might even do it if it decreased their income. But that is not what I'm primarily going to be concerned with here. Now, of course, there is a composite where the pension max might be chosen because it is seen to both increase income and increase flexibility at the same time. Since the pension max strategy involves the use of life insurance, it is typically going to be a life insurance agent that presents it or if it's your financial advisor, then the financial advisor is either going to bring the life insurance agent into the conversation or he or she is also going to function as a life insurance agent. So obviously the pension max wording, the phrase itself is designed to elicit interest in the strategy. Now rest assured, before we conclude the presentation, I will get into caveats. I'll get into the negatives. But for the time being, let me start by trying to explain why people find this option attractive in the first place. So I'm going to show an illustration of a scenario that is usually understood to be an example where the pension max outperforms the normal retirement options on the pension election form. And the easier one to illustrate is going to be the more money scenario. So I'm going to provide an example of reason number one 
getting more money. Now to get a fix on this, I'm going to briefly run through your options for survivorship. Now let's start with a 0% option. Now that of course is just another way of saying no survivorship. So if you were to go back to your pension election form and select installments with no survivorship, and once again, if you're not confident in these options, please make sure you're confident before you move forward here. For this example, we're going to pretend like the pensioner is offered $2,000 a month with no survivorship. But with no survivorship, of course, that means the survivor will get zero dollars if the pensioner dies. Let's swing to the opposite side. Somebody might say, well, obviously that's unacceptable. I want to make sure my husband, my wife gets something. So the opposite end of the spectrum would be 100% survivorship. Here, the offering would be $1,500 a month for the pensioner and $1,500 a month would continue to the survivor. Now, obviously this represents an increase, a positive over the survivorship option on no survivorship. However, the main deficit is obviously that the pensioner has to take a $500 a month decrease. Once again, these numbers I'm simply making up for this example, but that's the way survivorship normally works, which often pushes somebody to do a middle of the road option. So for example, on 50% survivorship, the pensioner might be offered $1,750 a month and the survivor might get half of that in the event that the pensioner dies, which would be $875. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, survivorship isn't free. For 100% survivorship, you give up $500 a month. Even 50% survivorship is still gonna cost the pensioner $250 every month. So at this point, a life insurance agent will ask something like this. What do you call it when you spend a certain amount of money every month, when it costs you something every month to guarantee a death benefit to someone else in the event of your death? And the answer is, it's called life insurance. Number two, sticking to the supplied options, maximizing the payout for the pensioner means minimizing the benefit for the survivor and vice versa. On the 100% survivorship option, the pensioner gets the least, the survivor gets the most, and on the 0% option, the pensioner gets the most and the survivor gets the least. Number three, on this example, using these numbers, the most money the survivor can possibly get is $1,500 a month. Of course, your numbers will almost certainly be different than the ones that I'm looking at here, but the basic principles will doubtless hold. There will be some amount that is the most the pensioner can get and some lower amount that is the most the survivor could get. And you wanna have those numbers fixed firmly in your mind, but for this example, the survivor's largest amount is going to be 1500 and it's important to see that. There is no scenario where the survivor gets more than $1,500 on this example. We're looking to see if the pensioner could use privately obtained life insurance that cost number one, less than $500 a month, but number two, provides a death benefit that's large enough so that an annuity can be purchased later on that will provide the annuitant with at least $1,500 a month. Now let's look at some actual numbers here. This is simply for illustration purposes only. Now we need two things for the pension max to work. Firstly, we need some life insurance policy now and we'll need an annuity later. So the life insurance policy is gonna be purchased on the pensioner and the annuity will eventually be purchased by the survivor. To make sure that the contract amounts are sufficient, we're actually gonna backwards engineer the life insurance policy amount from the annuity. I'm gonna enter single life on Charles Schwab's immediate annuity calculator. And I'm gonna select monthly income needed. And now here's where we need that $1,500 number. Your number obviously is gonna be different, but here we're gonna put in the maximum that the survivor could possibly get. And on my numbers, it's $1,500 a month. Now I'm making the survivor a 65 year old female. And this is for two interrelated reasons. Number one, women tend to live longer than men. And number two, since they have greater longevity, annuities will be more expensive on females, all other things being equal. And then of course you click next and here we're taken to a summary of results page. There are three columns for a variety of premium costs, payouts and option descriptions, but we're gonna ignore everything except a single number. The price tag for her to buy a $1,500 a month income stream for herself for the rest of her life. And in this example, that is $335,680. Now, had I used a 65-year-old male instead, the cost for the same $1,500 a month income stream would have been $319,000 and change. But again, I'm trying to make this number as big as I can make it here to better test the pension max's viability. Now, you might have a worry right off the bat. Won't she probably be older than 65 when she actually assumes the role of survivor? And if that's the case, why did I make her 65 years old? And of course, this is hopefully going to be true. We wouldn't want her to 
to become a widow anytime soon. But it's not actually a problem for the pension max scenario. To see this, we can go back to the annuity calculator and make her 10 years older. So if we have her born in 1946 instead of 56, and I'm recording this in 2021, we see that if she's 75 years old instead of 65, the same $1,500 a month lifetime annuity would actually cost her $87,268 less. So here the price tag is $248,000 and some change, and previously it was $335,000 and change. So the moral is, the older a person is, the lower their annuity cost, holding the payout and other factors fixed, of course. And you can run the numbers at different ages for yourself to verify this. But it may still leave you wondering, how is she supposed to pay for the annuity in the first place? And the answer is, from a life insurance policy that's on her husband. I've made him also 65 years old, male, average health, $350,000 of insurance, which is the closest this calculator could get to the required $335,680, is gonna cost him $394 a month. Once again, for comparison, had I made the pensioner female, I would have felt like I cheated since her insurance at average health would have been $111 cheaper than his. You might be thinking, is there a problem here? You see, this is a 20-year term policy, meaning the contract will expire around his age 85. Now, at this point, the insurance agent is likely to gesture towards commonly available life expectancy statistics. For example, Google's highest ranking search result at this date anyway, from a now six to seven-year-old USA Today article, suggests the average male will die around age 76.4. So in other words, the agent might assure you that a 20-year term policy will actually be in place for roughly 8.6 years longer than the average life expectancy for a male. Now we'll revisit the subject of longevity when we bring up criticisms in a moment. But again, the $64 question, or in this case, the $394 question is, where will the monthly premium money come from? And this answer brings us full circle. The pension max has three basic steps. Number one, choose the highest pension benefit you have access to. In this case, it's $2,000 a month. Number two, pay the insurance premium out of the extra money you get because you took the largest payout possible. So notice that on these numbers, the retiree would select $2,000 a month, and then after paying the roughly $400 for insurance, he'll still net about $1,600 a month. And that $400 a month buys him $350,000 worth of life insurance. And when he dies, his wife will use that insurance money to buy her annuity. And even if tragically he died just a few days into retirement, when her $1,500 a month annuity was at its most expensive, that $350,000 death proceed would be enough to cover the premium with some $14,000 to spare. And the numbers, as we said, only get more favorable for her from a premium standpoint the older she is when he dies. But wait for the caveats. Just as a sidebar, I've been talking as if the life insurance and the annuity will be two separate instruments, but it is sometimes possible to take life insurance policy payouts as a stream of annuity payments instead of as a lump sum. And you should bear that in mind. It's possibly an option for you. However the annuity is created, here's the bottom line. In this scenario, the pension max delivers $1,600 a month to the pensioner. And remember, this number is the difference of the $2,000 benefit minus his $400 insurance premium. Additionally, the pension max promises the survivor $1,500 a month in the event of the pensioner's death. And this was obtained through the use of a $350,000 life policy, which is enough in its death benefit to be able to create the required income stream. So the insurance salesperson's presentation will likely conclude with these sorts of observations. The pensioner gets the biggest payout by selecting no survivorship. So to get the most out of his pension, this is the option he is supposed to choose. Additionally, even though the largest survivorship benefit was only available on the 100% survivorship option, you can see it is here replicated by the strategy of using life insurance and an annuity. So the strategy is called a pension max, because the idea is it has the ability to provide both the pensioner and the survivor with their maximum benefits. 2,000 for the pensioner, 1,500 for the survivor and there's no bigger benefit available on the pension election form. So even after the insurance premium is paid, the couple comes out ahead income-wise. And that is a pretty typical example of how the concept is presented. The wording pension maximization is supposed to instill the idea that this is the option that enables you to get the most out of your pension. As far as the name pension max is concerned, I would say don't get too hung up on that label. Admittedly, it is mostly an advertising gimmick, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to it or that that it isn't worth your time to look into. As I've said many times in previous videos, 
pension elections, retirement options, and the like are not only irrevocable, but they affect you for the rest of your life. In other words, you don't get a do-over. So retirement decisions ought to be guided by the old carpenter's adage, measure twice, cut once. Now let's take stock of what we've heard and gone over so far. And I am gonna start off by acknowledging some of the potential positives for the pension max strategy. And then I will conclude by bringing negatives into the picture, caveats, qualifications, and a brief critique. So first of all, there's no question that the pension max can sometimes be shown to save money, at least on paper. If the pensioner is super healthy, then those savings could be increased. And then at least on one reading, the pension max strategy can even be seen to be more attractive the healthier the pensioner is. If the pensioner is in very good health, then the savings is even more robust. So on the $350,000 20-year term policy example, if the premium were brought down to $259 due to good health, then the pensioner's monthly income actually goes up to $1,741, which brings it very closely aligned with what they would have received had they elected 50% survivorship and Remember, the $350,000 death benefit enables the survivor to literally double the death benefit over what they would have received had they elected 50% survivorship. Another main positive is going to be the flexibility. You're not restricted to the options that you're given on the pension election form by your employer. The pension election form had certain options, and on my example, it was basically no survivorship, 50% or 100%. In our case, you're stuck choosing amongst one of those options. With the pension max, the sky's the limit. If you wanted to create a 75% survivorship option, if you wanted to guarantee the survivor $2,000 a month, all of these are possibilities that you wouldn't have on the standard pension election form. If the spouse who's designated a survivor dies before the pensioner, then the pensioner can simply cancel the life insurance and thereby give a bump to his or her monthly income. Finally, although I am not a tax preparer, this is not tax advice, I am not a tax expert of any kind, you'll often read in these presentations of the Pension Max that there are certain tax advantages. And in specific, that means that an annuity purchased with a life insurance death proceed may not be as taxable as a normal pension benefit would be. Pensions that are funded with pre-tax money generate income payments that are 100% taxable. On the other hand, non-qualified annuities have a portion of the payment that is considered to be non-taxable. According to one financial services website, in such a situation, settling a non-qualified annuity results in a monthly payment that is only partially taxable since a portion is considered to be a return of premium. And in our case, the premium would have been paid with an an income tax-free death benefit. Bear in mind that taxes are always complex. For more information, you can explore the concept of the exclusion ratio. And as always, for a commentary on your personal situation, seek the advice of a tax expert. Okay, now a few qualifications and negatives. The pension max strategy, even where the numbers look good, is based upon assumptions. And these can fail to, quote, pan out, as one Kiplinger article put it. Annuity settlement options are partially dependent on the environment in which those options are elected. So the interest rate environment, the market environment, and other factors that have nothing to do with the individual annuitants. And number two, and perhaps more importantly, many of these figures are simply projections. On the pension max scenario, the only product that is going to be in place from day one, so to speak, is going to be the life insurance on the pensioner. The annuity is likely to be something purchased down the road. But if that's the case, then the numbers that go along with that annuity and the numbers that go into the settlement options are only going to actually be fixed and provided to you in detail when you purchase the annuity, when you fund it, and when you annuitize it. It's not that this couldn't work. It's simply that this is just really complicated, much more complicated than simply electing a survivorship option from your pension form. It is true that life insurance premiums can be expected to be lower the healthier you are, but consider why this is the case. The insurance company wants to know how likely it is that you're going to die in a given period of time. The higher the likelihood, the higher the premium. So we can infer that lower premiums imply a lower likelihood of death, but then this raises the likelihood that the insured person is going to outlive the term policy. So I built our example on a 20-year term policy, and I presented Google search results 
result for the average life expectancy for a male, which is 76.4 years. However, there are a number of alternate estimates and information sources. For example, the Social Security Administration assumes that a 65-year-old male could live another 17.89 years, bringing his age at death to around 83. Or again, the Actuaries Longevity Illustrator, developed in tandem with the American Academy of Actuaries and the Society of Actuaries, provides probabilities for a given person reaching a specified age. So here, for John at the age of 65, if we assume his retirement begins at 65, you can see the probability he'll live to 85 is given as 53%. The probability he'll live till 90 is given at 32%, and there's even a 4% chance he'll live to age 100. If he's in excellent health, the chance that he'll live to 100 goes to 8%, the chance that he'll live to 90 goes to 42%, and so on. And even a change such as his retirement age, if we bump it to 70, gives him a slight boost in some of the probabilities. And we're dealing with layers of speculation here, so much so that many financial advisors and retirement planners are encouraging people to build plans on the assumption that they'll live until the age of 95, or at least somewhere between 91 and 94. So the danger is that the term coverage will lapse before the insured person dies, destroying the survivorship plans. One fix for this would be to use permanent insurance in place of temporary insurance, but these policies are likely to cost more, not only more than a term policy with a comparable death benefit, but as you can see from the figures on the screen, more possibly than is even available using the pension max strategy. In other words, the retiree might end up spending so much on insurance premiums that they end up with less every month than they would have received had they just gone with a survivorship option. This is one reason why sophisticated pension max scenario planners often use a blend of temporary and permanent insurance. For example, maybe the pensioner gets $200,000 in a term policy and $150,000 in a guaranteed universal life policy. The combination of premiums is still in the neighborhood of $400 a month, assuming that is the best health rating. On my example, if the pensioner dies before the age of 85, the survivor gets both the temporary and the permanent insurance payouts, totaling $350,000. On the other hand, if the pensioner outlives the term policy, the survivor only gets $150,000. But this isn't actually a problem because a $1,500 a month lifetime annuity only costs $150,000 at her age 85. I know this is complicated. Just a word of caution, however, sometimes there is an age limit for purchasing annuities. The survivor may want to open the annuity in advance of receiving the death proceed in order to ensure that he or she will not be too old to buy when the time comes. Now with the pension max, the fact that you can cancel the insurance policy if the survivor dies before the pensioner does, does give an advantage. However, if your pension has a pop-up provision, then you might be able to approximate the same thing with the provided election options. Pop-up provisions are more common in government pensions than they are in corporate pensions, arguably. A non-qualified annuity that's been purchased with an income tax-free death proceed can have certain tax advantages. Bear in mind that the pension max option does have a few tax consequences itself. Let's take an obvious one. For example, We'll assume that your pension is fully taxable. Well, in that case, it's fairly obvious that the more money you get from your pension, the more taxes you're going to owe. This seems almost too obvious to remark upon, but this fact can reduce the attractiveness of the pension max option, and I'll give you an example of that. If a person is in the 12% tax bracket, then after they've paid their insurance premium, they'd net $1,366 on my pension max example. This is only $46 more than they would have had had they selected the 100% survivorship option right off the bat. But obviously your actual numbers will depend on the particulars of your situation. Consult your tax preparer. Some of the biggest reservations, such as those expressed in this Washington Post article from 1994, have to do with two things. Life insurance agent dishonesty and the failure of certain policies to live up to their expectations. To the first concern, you're going to want to make sure that you trust any agent that you're working with. Some sources recommend only working with fee-based agents who do not have any stake in you buying a particular product and who don't work on commission. I'd say working with a commission-based agent can be okay, provided that you have a good relationship with that person and provided that you have other trusted advisors, such as attorneys, financial planners, tax preparers, that you can take the proposals to and who can give you second opinions. But in the event that there's some kind of a dispute between these trusted advisors, you're gonna have to cast the tie-breaking vote. And after all, this is your retirement. It has to be your decision ultimately. This just means understanding the numbers and concepts is vital. 
which is why I have tried to put so much into this video. But the Washington Post also gives a few additional tips for trying to get a handle on these things as well. Number one, make sure you understand what the insurance will cost you in terms of monthly premium. Level term policies and whole life policies often have fixed premiums that don't change over time. Adjustable or flexible policies such as universal life can be a different story altogether. With these more complicated policies, you're gonna to wanna to get a firm answer, preferably in writing, as to whether or not these future premiums are guaranteed or whether the amount of money you're going to have to put into the contract is dependent on market factors, interest rate assumptions, and other things along the lines of that. For an overview of the different policy types and for a summary of concerns that are unique to universal life insurance, see some of my other videos. If you're favoring the pension max because of the boost in monthly income that you hope to get, you're going to want to be especially clear on these points. Number two, make sure that the future annuity will provide your survivor with the income level you both expect and that they will need. And make sure you understand how the pension max stacks up to the survivorship options presented on your pension election forms. The post also reminds you to get all of this in writing. For life insurance, getting these promises in writing is going to involve getting an illustration and getting the contract paperwork. If possible, take the contract and the enclosed illustration to a trusted third party to get a second opinion. Obviously, it's best to have all desired clarity about the proposal prior to signing anything. Bear in mind that U.S. state laws usually provide for a free look period, which is an interval generally between 10 and 20 days where you can cancel a life insurance policy with no penalty. Now, this free look period begins upon policy delivery, which means it doesn't start until you've received the completed paperwork. Even if you think you knew what you were signing, obviously you want to take another look at it to make sure that it looks the way you expected it to look. Now, annuities also have both illustrations and contracts. But because of the way the pension max works, the annuity portion might be entirely or partially a future step. But this poses a definite problem from the standpoint of getting everything in writing. A standalone annuity illustration is basically worthless, and this is because annuity illustrations by themselves are going to expire 7 days, 14 days, 30 days after they're created unless they're conjoined with a contract. Possibly the best case scenario for you would be to get a deferred annuity with some nominal investment that would be able to at least secure some of the future settlement options. Generally though, the settlement options are going to depend on the current assumptions, including the interest rate environment that obtain when you're ready to settle the annuity. And obviously settling the annuity is going to involve having it be fully funded, which is going to depend on the life insurance policy having paid out. You need to exercise extreme caution and prudence especially on this step. The bottom line is that the pension max might work for you, but the devil really is in the details. For further research, see my other videos. And if you think you might have been dealt with unfairly or even fraudulently, I have a video touching on that as well. Now, I know that this concept is somewhat tricky. It's difficult to get a grasp on. But if you found something of use in the video or if you found something of interest, I ask that you like the video. If you would like to see additional future content, please click the subscribe button. And if you click the notification bell, you'll actually be alerted to that content as it becomes available. Either way, I thank you so much for being with me today. I wish you all the best on your pension elections, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you so much.